Today, I'm going to be attempting to beat Resident Evil 4 Remake without running. And that's not all. Not only would we be walking our way through the game's hardest difficulty, we were going to be attempting to achieve the highest rank in the game as well, an S plus rank. Sounds easy, right? Well, apart from the fact that only someone with a total disregard for their own life would attempt to do something like this, the S Plus rank was something of a Capcom Medal of Honor, a coveted accolade reserved only for the most mentally ill of gamers who could beat the main story in under five and a half hours and with only 15 saves or less. With no glitches or OP starting weaponry allowed, would this anti-speedrun speedrun or gaming Darwin award even be possible? Well, there is only one way to find out, and a pre-warning, this video contains scenes that some speedrunners may find disturbing. So the quest to walk our way through the entire game started the night before our illegal incursion into Spain, arriving at the hotel to find that the suitcase we picked up wasn't ours. Instead of containing state-of-the-art equipment an agent on a presidential rescue mission would need, it instead contained something a little more eye-catching. Despite receiving a 75% boost to our sex appeal and the curvature of Leon's buns now making my eyes water, our ability to run had been nerfed into the ground. These boots, while stylish, were impossible to run in, with Leon barely able to walk up to the opening cabin without breaking both ankles. <laughs> See what's taking so long? Is that a joke? And as we roundhouse Zach Galifankis into his own wall, it really began to dawn on me what I'd actually signed myself up to. The sands of time had already begun to pour against us, and after it took me a whopping eight minutes just to make it to the village town centre, it suddenly felt like five and a half hours. It really wasn't much time at all. Whilst the impending bingo session wasn't really filling me with confidence, I had done plenty of studying prior to this run to understand what the best strategies would be at the toughest points of each chapter, and for the village, had come to the conclusion that the double grenade speedrun strat was the most viable way to get the church bell to ring early. By shanking Grandma in the back up the right path and diving into this house, we can grab this crate which had a 100% chance to drop a grenade, which we rolled delicately into this old couple's living room, taking out a nice portion of the initial Neighbourhood Watch Alliance outside. My exit out of the house was less than ideal, but we do get some additional kills which helped to expedite the village timer, as one shotgun shell to this unlucky volunteer's face revoked his access to bingo, sounding the church bell and saving us a grenade in the process. No, don't do it! I'm a virgin! Now, one key ingredient of any speedrun strategy, even a walking one, was to move as efficiently as possible through the game and avoid as much wasteful pathing and backtracking as we could. Time wasn't the only priority for us either though. We needed to balance time saving with collecting enough cash for upgrades and RPGs. So as an example, I left the necklace located behind the chapel for later as on my return with the key from Mendez's house, I could easily grab it on my way through. Up next in the farm area, we collect some treasure and smash some medallions before taking a quick shortcut through to collect the cog by shooting the lock to this door through the window instead of going all the way up and around. With the cog in hand, the brute smashes our back doors in and in the ensuing chase, we were able to get the cog in place and flip the gate switch just in time. We then head downstairs to use the conveniently placed dynamite we'd left to flatline the brute's life support. And after clearing our way through the reinforcements, we could enter the fishing village with time ticking away. Speed, in a very loose sense of the word, was key, but certain areas like the fishing village or the island base would benefit instead from a calm and paced approach. On professional difficulty, the ability to autosave at convenient spots throughout the chapter was disabled. So walking recklessly through tough spots could inevitably lead us to fast traveling back to the start of the chapter, or in this case, the start of the game. Ah oh, shit, here we go again. Which I could conveniently demonstrate for you here is apparently my challenge had directly angered God who came down from the clouds to smite me from existence. Now, on the unexpected but guaranteed eventuality that we would be decorating the walls in tomato soup, one thing to remember here is that selecting continue or load from the game over screen meant that your timer would continue from when you were unalived. However, if you quit to the main menu and load your recent checkpoint from there, your in-game timer would reset to its original time at that save. This would be a key strat going forward as death would no doubt be plentiful and as we arrived back at the fishing village 14 minutes later, I made sure to issue out personal karma to the dynamite 
that cost me those precious minutes. And using that calm and paced approach I talked about, we can methodically strip out the rest of the enemies in the area. In the basement of the old house, the chief forces us to become surrogates for his little alien children against our will, and as we grew his little babies in our non-existent wombs, I remembered something about the upcoming area. Inside the abandoned factory, which was the designated village concentration camp, there was a timed gate here that not only contained our stolen gear, but a trigger to get the merchant to unlock the main door required for us to progress the game. With no ability to put our legs in front of one another at an accelerated pace, it was impossible for us to make it through the gate in time. Without even having used 20% of our allocated time, we were now stuck here forever. But no, I wasn't going to end the video here like some absolute cuck. Whilst I do concede that the game can't be completed by only walking, the challenge of seeing if we could complete the game with an S plus rank was technically still alive, and I'll explain why. If I turn the handle here and walk to the door and clipped through it by manipulating the very fabric of the in-game world, the time it would have taken me to walk to the door, as if it was open, had been counted fairly, right? Listen, I know this is pure copium, but seriously, who wants to watch Can You Get to the Factory on Resident Evil 4 Remake without running? Trust me, nobody wants to see that shit, alright? So at least walking around to the door meant that we'd counted the time it would have taken to get there in-game as accurately as possible, but, you know, feel free to crucify me in the comments if you disagree. Shrugging off this heartbreak, the merchant offers us an egg in these trying times in the shape of the Nazi testicle exploder, which would come in handy as we now had a mountain to climb, or more precisely, a valley. But just before that, at our first merchant, one useful bit of information for any S plus rank hunters was that managing, crafting and organising your inventory in-game caused our precious remaining time to continue to leak away. Whereas if you do the same thing from any typewriter, it actually pauses the in-game timer. Very nice. So, Dynamite Valley, a place where people came to be force-fed used suppositories. What the fuck is this piece of shit? Despite the potential this place had to rupture my growing RE4 remake aneurysm, Ooh. the easiest way to tackle the opening segment without being violated was to use their own dynamite against them. By entering this little hut here, we could funnel enemies through the window, which was the only way in, whilst the dynamite throwers out front helped to eliminate their own friends and family on our behalf. I need help with the first cycle of enemies forcibly sent to heaven, grabbing the crank rings the bell for round two, which whilst being a much tougher fight up the mountainside, using the red barrels for some multi-kills helps us to open the door and get out of there fairly easily. Attempt number two went much better and we open the door and make it to... Okay, seriously, this is the last time I died here. That was a lie. We do successfully break the cycle of dynamite abuse and beat Salvador in a duel to the death before breaking into Mendez's house to retrieve the church key. After being flung by our high heels into the bed frame outside, I couldn't let emotion play into my decision-making process. Time was extremely precious, and on this occasion, saving the dog was a luxury I just couldn't afford. Oh, for fuck's sake, fine. It would have been slightly hypocritical of me to leave the dog to die, considering I made time to go into the downstairs toilet to wipe this guy's ass for him. But we stuck to our principles and I can only respect that. How could you do this to me? Question mark. We snipe the narc en route back to the village to prevent the dogs from appearing and do a little tidy up in the opening arena, grabbing our previously left treasure and doing the same outside the church before issuing out non-consensual lobotomies to the crew stationed on the mountainside. In the quarry, we commit crimes against nature when I accidentally throw what I thought was a flash grenade to humanely take down the crows, when in fact I'd equipped a HE grenade. Before we arrive in the swamp area, a particularly godless place that smelt like bin juice and had a very high probability to ruin our day. Our patience pays dividends when we wait for the brute who apparently had the eyesight of a Garador to pass us by so that we could assassinate him, meaning that we could deal with the rest of the enemies here with relative ease. With the fuel for the boat retrieved and every last morsel of treasure, medallions and resources collected, we could finish up the Del Largo boss fight before being formally introduced to our first piece of human head spaghetti. And once we find our replacement boat, we can begin our first of a series of stop-offs around the lake. We head straight over and absolutely obliterate the Lunker Bass, but without any room in our pockets for a £10 fish, we'd come back for him later. 
Whilst out there, we stop off at Chicken Island for some free-range eggs for a health-boosting omelette, as well as the prized golden egg. This was going to be a key piece of our strategy for later in the game. Next up, we retrieve the first puzzle head before grabbing the Alexandrite and Red Nine off the shipwreck, swinging by to grab the depraved idol, as well as the locked treasure box, culminating in a nice full circle to stop by for the second prostate head before attempting the slowest quick getaway you'd ever seen. With the church insignia now in the bag, we luckily remembered to head back and grab the lunk of bass. How many of you forgot? And with a thunderous pace, we arrive back at the merchant and do a bit of upgrading, ready for El Gigante, our first boss fight and our first test at how problematic the lack of a shift key could be. Despite having skipped leg day in comparison to the rest of him, El Gigante still could shift some gears when he needed to. The fight really came down to hitting our shots, which, having previously completed the game with 100% accuracy, this was my speciality. But if you actually were good, an opening volley of shots could get him down immediately for some strong damage in the opening cycle. And from there, we're able to hit our QTEs, walk in between his legs to dodge his attacks, and finish the big guy off with a final round of sniper shots. A fairly straightforward boss fight, but we had many more challenges to come, so we mopped up the resources in the boss arena and put a rabid dog down back en route to the church to collect Ashley, whose face of relief at being rescued quickly evaporated when she realized that we would be walking, not running, our way out of this absolute shithole. <laughs> We make quite possibly the slowest getaway ever from the church crew, and with a few flashes and HE grenades, we can make it to the armistice line here. What's an armistice line, I hear you say? Throughout the game, there's an invisible line where enemies from the previous room or section are not programmed to enter. So if we can make it to these points, enemies will immediately de-aggro and leave us alone, meaning that Ashley, who often lagged behind, could run to us without being kidnapped. At least that's what I thought would happen we'd apparently picked up a second Ashley, a Ganado who, like a soldier from North Korea, had defected south and wanted to join Leon in his mission out of here. Well, against my will, we were apparently now a trio. Frodo, Sam, and <laughs> But our time with Sam, however, was short-lived, as in the battle with the brute and old grannies back in the village square, he was caught in the crossfire, which was my way of saying I accidentally shot him in the face. At least he'd found the peace that he was looking for. Oh my god. After mourning the loss of Samwise for all of five seconds, we grabbed the treasure from the barn and the locked drawer in the outhouse before walking down to the windmill area, which was a bit messy as Ashley gets assaulted on her way over, but we take a deep breath and land the tightest rescue shot needed to save her. <gasps> take the bloody shot! As we welcomed into the cabin, using a speedrun mentality here helped to make the whole sequence fairly tolerable. As soon as you spawn in, you can line up two double headshots on both the windows and blow the red barrel on the third. From there, getting a further two to three kills at this window will spawn a group of reinforcements at this gate, who can be conveniently yeeted into the Shadow Realm with a grenade or two. The next few enemies to enter the cabin should immediately drop the other two boards required to block up the entirety of downstairs, and then it was just a case of mopping up some resources before heading downstairs to fight the return of the brute. With our health pool reaching critically low levels, I've got nothing left! My sphincter could finally unclench as Ashley slammed open the door to thankfully draw a close to this chapter. At the next merchant, we're now able to upgrade the Virgin Hillbilly shotgun to the Chad riot gun a beautifully crafted piece of man-made death that would accompany us through the rest of the game as our main shotgun. We shank an old lady doing a dump in the street and her accomplice before grabbing the diamond from the crate up here. Getting spotted was unfortunately inevitable, but a flash grenade thrown directly into the onrushing crowd kept them at bay long enough for us to make a break for the next armistice line. Or so we fought as Ashley, right on cue, is grabbed, putting a massive turd inside our perfectly crafted escape plan. With an emergency flash crafted, and a fractured face received. Ashley was rescued, but with no heels, we have to stumble to the nearest crate like some crackhead trying to find the local spice dealer. <laughs> In that madness, we'd picked up yet another strange man, but after our previous heartbreak, I just wasn't emotionally ready to adopt another stray human again. Fighting the Chainsaw Sisters for the checkpoint crank was quite intense due to their insta-kill potential, which, when I stupidly tried to speedrun through here thinking I was actually good at the game, I was able to get a taster of. With a safer strat adopted, we exit out the back door to give us the breathing room we needed to land a suitably phased clan S collateral on the both of them to retrieve the goods. In the next area, we witness possibly the most ludicrous chase sequence since Princess Leia's escape in Obi-Wan. I know you! Chief Mendez, a man with the power of Jesus Christ flowing through his massive bald head and legs as powerful as howitzers, 
failed to catch up to a man casually walking away from him in six inch heels. Oof, F's in chat for Mendes. However, it would soon be F's in chat for us, as despite our successful escape, Mendes came flying through the drywall at 60 miles an hour, intending to cleanse our sinful souls. That's the way go. Starting the fight with him, we immediately turn around and take the ladder behind us up to the first floor. Up top, we have the perfect angle to hit his back eye with our sniper rifle. With a few extra shotgun shells, we can land on top of him and tickle his weak spot to release his legs and start his second form. To avoid the flaming wood thrown at us, you can either time your walks straight across like this, or like I found out, you can just go up and down the ladder, which for the most part does work. Once we get Mendes to the floor here, we can repeat step one to fully flambe him and head up to start the castle segment. Now, I'd been under the illusion that I'd been making solid progress here. A disgusting fact that you may like to know was that the world's best speedrunners for Resident Evil 4 Remake had just finished the game, whereas I was just starting the castle section. A truly rancid four. So with fresh time-based anxiety coursing through our veins, our first port of call at the castle was to buy the broken butterfly. Another key ingredient for our cooking session later with the golden egg, so grabbing it at a discount now made sense. We walk awkwardly past the plaga baptism taking place in the next room before arriving at the battlements where we come face to face with our arch nemesis. I had a history of rage and resentment with these guys, but it was staggeringly increased now that I could only walk. It was like they knew my weakness and the tears they caused to roll down my face simply motivated them to keep ruining my life. Before entering the catapult section, we can shoot the casket here to release the cannon early and save us from having to make a trip all the way around to this area. Using the cannon to fin out the zealots and save Ashley in what must have looked like a Looney Tunes sketch, we can then tidy up the blue medallions and as we weren't heading around to this area, we can toss a grenade over the wall to break the last one and complete blue medallion free. After we give Passanta red dress PTSD flashbacks, nah. yeah, bad chance. The castle welcome party were easily countered with a grenade for the shield enemies and a flash to give us enough time to make it round to the door that Ashley had just unlocked for us. As we grabbed the dungeon key, we slipped gently down into said dungeon, where we meet the Garador. Once a man, he'd gouged his own eyes out after being subjected to the most unspeakable visual torture known to man. And I had truly done my best morning and afternoon to play it their way. He can ew. One of you is going to be lucky enough to get a custom roll of your choice in my Discord server. Lucky for us though, we still had our own eyes, and by tucking ourselves into this corner, we could avoid his initial rugby tackle before throwing a flash that distracts him long enough for us to crank the exit door open and slip out without having to fight him. With the sword puzzle completed, I myself had to resist the temptation to become a Garador myself as I stepped into the Water Hall, a place that should have been renamed to the Diarrhea Hall to more accurately represent the experience in here. Good afternoon and welcome to Tesco. This is a customer announcement. This septic tank of a segment was standing between us and the end of the chapter and contained all the things that I found personally offensive. Ah! After sniping the first two archers, we head left to spawn in the first wave of mindless urine drinkers before heading downstairs to begin our retrieval of the halo wheel. A collateral on these two and a few headshots later, and we can flash five plagas from existence in one go for extra epilepsy value. With the halo wheel in hand, we fin out the crossbowers out on the balconies before fighting off the rest of our potential killers in the main area. When we send Ashley up here like a little borrower to do the rest of our bidding for us and lower the platform, we make sure to take out the first zealot approaching her before she cranks the platform up, where we then allow her to be kidnapped by the second one. This patented strat from my no-kill run allows Ashley to be carried all the way over to the other side of the room for us, saving us ammo and allowing us to focus on the enemies on our floor. A mobile Ashley Kresh, if you will. And then just as she was about to be taken through the portal to hell, we can release her from her human Uber before turning to snipe the runners from both these doors to ensure Ashley is left alone. Once Ashley rejoins us, we walk over to the start of chapter eight, where she gives us a handshake with our own knife before leaving us to continue solo again, which I'll be honest, I was okay with. We grab the beetle off the back wall to sell for some extra cash and stock up on some sushi to help alleviate our ever-reducing healing stock. We also grab the emerald here to fulfill the future task, a jewel thief from the merchant, before upgrading our pistol to the blacktail and heading into a local underground rave. Gloria las plagas. Gloria las plagas. That's 
son of a bitch. The strategy for this room wasn't actually anything fancy or elaborate like you might think. I just walked straight up the right-hand side and started blasting Danny DeVito style. After we grabbed the lantern, the fancy mirror, and exited quietly from the area, the plot thickened to the consistency of diarrhea in the next room. A mysterious femme fatale had arrived wearing our stolen jacket, apparently being the one who had collected our suitcase from the airport. As neither of us were willing to give up the other's clothes until we got ours back, the ensuing fight to break the stalemate yielded no clear winner, with our mysterious woman disappearing out of the window with my stuff before we could shoot her in the face. Disappointed that our belongings were still missing, we watched something run across the wall that you'd probably find in the average Australian person's bathroom before reaching the battlements where we can skip the entire section here by using a grenade or aiming right here to release the weight and open the door early. Which was pretty useful because we can immediately head up the ladder to retrieve some additional treasure and commit crossbow genocide. We then make a very daring escape from the Urukai captain stationed at the castle at speeds that were probably on par with an old lady crossing the street. And with him being able to hit me with rocks from two towns away, we had to make a few tactical stops to avoid being put to sleep. Once safely through this section, we can raise the second cannon to reconfigure his face before, unfortunately, finding Ashley again. With our ball and chain now in tow, we can mop up the resources from the main area before executing Order 66, issued by the UK government on all of the XL bullies that had infested this maze. En route through, we grab the chessboard, flick the switches for all three of the flags, and arrive in the Grand Hall. Whoa, whoa, whoa. For the Chimera puzzle, I'd come up with some pathing that would help to give us maximum time save here. First off, we head into the dining room, collecting three of the medallions, murdering a rat in cold blood before solving the puzzle and retrieving the serpent's head. From there, we move into the goat's head room, flashing the lever guy to prevent him from sending us down to be brutally murdered and allowing us to collect the puzzle piece and smash the medallion located here. After we fight our way out of there, we move into the lion's head room where we take care of the three rounds of plaga infested armor before shooting another rat and retrieving the cubic device. Completing the rooms in this order meant that we can come out downstairs perfectly in front of the merchant's room, allowing us to collect this piece of treasure with our new Tetris key before heading back on the Salazar subway to the entrance hall to grab the crown, a highly valuable piece of treasure. After this, our final hugely critical task was to buy our first rocket launcher from the merchant. Now, we didn't need it for this chapter, but the early purchase and use would all make sense later. With all tasks completed and all emblems and treasure now acquired, we could move into Ashley's section. Now, you'd be forgiven, like me, for thinking that this would be a nice stroll through Night Metropolis, a refreshing break from the PTSD-induced campaign of Leon, but oh, how wrong you would be. The first task is fairly straightforward. Because we're filthy little cheaters, we can solve the clock puzzle straight away, allowing us to head downstairs to the Plaga dungeon, which, with the lantern's freezing ability, was easy enough. But after we pick up the Salazar insignia, we were told to make our way back upstairs without the lantern, meaning our cheeks were now fully exposed to being clapped on the way out. With the feeling of several demons mouth breathing on my neck behind me, oh, Jesus. like the brave boy I was, I walked out of there as fast as my little legs could carry me. Somehow we make it out of there and we pass what appears to be a knight's penis, which in hindsight was foreshadowing for what was about to happen, for I was about to be on the receiving end of a dicking the biggest dicking I'd ever taken in this game. This turned out to be a fate worse than death. If I hadn't acquired the taste of bleach before this section, it would have certainly become my cocktail of choice after it. <coughs> For those of you who have never had the misfortune of dying here before, you may be interested to know that Ashley's fragile body is made of the consistency of a digestive biscuit. One hit and she's gone, which was an unfortunate multiplier to the difficulty here. One discombobulation and I'd be back at the start of the maze. Which was fantastic, as the knights here cannot be outwalked. And because there are so many of them here, even if you could get around this first guy, you'd be instantly overrun and pile-drived into the floor. With no autosave here, we were instantly forced, without our consent, back to the start of the chapter. And the nightmare didn't stop there, oh no. Even if you could make it up the lift, once there, you had another set of knights to dodge past as well, all of whom seemed to be specifically positioned to ensure I never left this hellhole. So after my fifth playthrough of fighting off homeless people in the maze again and again and making it within a pubic hair of the lift before being split in half, I'd suffered a substantial decline in the quality of my mental health and decided to have a short break. There was no way I was gonna throw in the towel here, so like the little degenerate goblin that I was, I loaded up an old hardcore save and got to work training. 
trying different solutions, different paths. And after an hour, like Doctor Strange, I'd gone through all 14,605,000 outcomes here and arrived at the one scenario that would give us victory. Loading back into Professional, I first made a judgement call on our saves. Up until now, I had enough saves to last me until the end of each main chapter. But this section, it was so random that the thought of dying and having to replay any of it again actually made me physically sick. So I made the executive decision here to save at the start of Ashley's section, meaning that we'd have to skip a save somewhere along the way. But with our progress now secured, I can now showcase to you the fruition of my autism. The first move is to head left and get into the first knight's face. If you bait him into an attack like this, it'll force him into the full swing and recovery animation, giving us a few precious seconds to keep him occupied. After that, we move carefully into this corner, where as soon as we see the knight from the middle area appear in our screens, we'd move forward, where the pillar would cause the knight to take the corner wide, attack, and allow us to get around him. From here, we needed to keep a straight and steady path, again moving straight into the knight that breaks through this barrier here and repeating step one to entice him into an attack. With him occupied, we can then move straight away to this knight to trigger him to life before moving back out behind him. This ensures that he doesn't come alive and block us on the stairs, instead moving around behind to chase us. From here, we just about avoid this knight sword splitting us in two and after quite possibly the most stressful walk up a set of stairs we'd ever do, we just make it into the lift before half a dozen swords come crashing down on the lift door. I would be like so much more excited by this if this hell was over. <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> the next step in this slow-paced horror movie started by luring the next knight down the stairs where we give him the classic fake out around this pillar. Once on the stairs, it was just a case of holding our nerve as we dodged right to avoid the second knight before arriving in the library, an area we'd neglected due to us already knowing the time on the clock puzzle. There are two knights here guarding the door to the exit as well as more soulless pieces of metal flooding in from the depths of the library to try and head us off. Luckily, I've played my fair share of Dead by Daylight, so doing a 360 to dodge a killer's attack was a not so foreign concept to me. A strategy I never thought I'd be doing in a Resident Evil game, but here we are. Following a very specific technique, where if we move to this knight's side and immediately cut in and forward again, we could trigger the first and second knight into an attack that would land perfectly either side of us, allowing us to awkwardly slip through the middle of them and up the stairs to victory. <laughs> If I hadn't been so close to making it out of here, I may have committed seppuku at my desk using a pencil, but with a renewed sense of faith in this process I'd created, on my third attempt, I was able to get one of the knights to trigger an attack behind me, which I think blocked the door just long enough to prevent the rest of them from catching me up. The relief that I felt making it to the top of those stairs was immeasurable, and my day was no longer ruined. I'd spent considerable time finding and practicing this strat, and it felt good to know that absolutely nobody else on earth would ever use this again. A win was a win, but I could confidently say that I'd rather have Jigsaw suck my balls through the eyeball device than to ever, ever have to do this section again. After recovering from my full psychotic breakdown in the mausoleum, we arrived at the chapter end where we saved our progress at speeds that could have split the very fabric of time apart. We take control of Leon again where we double back into the library to take care of the last rodent for more pest control and we move into the hive of the Novistadors. At a distance, these guys were okay to fight without the proper functionality of our legs. It gets a little tense in close quarters, but it was no worries. But what was worries, however, was the Garador room. Lucky for us, our in-game IQ had been growing at an exponential rate, and once in the hypothetical library, we sounded this specific bell on the right-hand side of the room, which grouped both Garadors up together. Once they were perfectly positioned here, we threw heavy grenades engraved with braille that informed both of them that they were about to be sent directly to hell. We were then ejected from the all-you-can-drink mimosa bar and begin our slog through the sewers. We pick up our second crown of the run and collect our pre-purchased rocket launcher from Chapter 9 for Verdugu. On his dramatic entrance through the rafters, he's too fast and was able to give us a singular love tap, but one nitrogen shower later and we can convert him into a Verdugu jigsaw puzzle. After Leon flashes his massive package to Luis, what the this was where our rocket launcher purchase in Chapter 9 comes into play. In Professional, purchasing the rocket launcher comes with a two-chapter cooldown, meaning if we had purchased the Verdugu rocket launcher in Chapter 10, I wouldn't have the option to buy a rocket launcher for what I was about to do now. Rather than having to torture ourselves with fighting Salvador, his wife and all the cretins down in the mine with him, with our rocket launcher we don't need his dynamite and can actually clear the cave-in ourselves. 
With that skip, the double date with the El Gigantes was up next, where we can flash the first one and dump him into the lava toilet straight away, before doing a tango around the switch control unit with the second one, whilst we wait for Luis to return with the dynamite. We head down to bootleg Disneyland and jump on the Indiana Jones ride, where we send Salvador on a journey down to the depths of Moria. Arriving at the Plaga dig site, we take care of the little pustules above us for the insect hive challenge, and do our part to bring forward the extinction of the Navistadors. Krauser then turns Luis into a skewer. Luis! isn't the bitch in the red dress. Before proceeding to apply the two knights attached to our heels directly into his face to avenge him. We pay some respects to Luis and grab the lift over to the clock tower where we can take out the flamethrower statue on the way up to avoid getting our eyebrows singed off and shoot this guy off the switch to stop him from hitting us in the face with his balls. Wait. We grab the treasure around the clock tower before beginning our slow journey up the lift. Apart from this bar being like a goddamn lightsaber and me running out of ammo halfway up, forcing me to issue our epilepsy instead of death, we can cross over the bridge made of toothpicks and upgrade the Magnum's firepower before pulling out the most powerful weapon in the game, the Golden Egg. This little beauty had been in our inventory since Chicken Island and after making an extremely careful inventory move to equip it, not eat it. We were now face to face with Salazar whose weakness was the rotting salmonella encased in the golden exterior of this egg. With unfertilized chicken baby now flooding into his eyes, we can finish Salazar off straight away with the Eastwood Magnum before dodging past the knights in the dock and setting our differences aside with the suitcase thief to catch a lift over to the island. After casually checking to see how we were doing for time, it was very apparent that it was quickly evaporating. With plenty left to go, we need to get through the island as efficiently as possible, starting here in the opening gulag, where you can actually complete it stealth only, helping to avoid fighting Big Chungus and his reinforcements. If we shoot both of the crossbow guards and the spotlight here, we prevent them from seeing us when we enter the area and immediately sounding the alarm. Once here, we wait for the right cycle to knife this guy in the back before turning off the first turret and then passing the Lannisters' regards onto this guy. The Lannisters send their regards. We then need to perform this next assassination so that this guy here doesn't see us, and if done perfectly, it will mean we can flick the second turret off and head out of this place relatively pain-free. After we do the cool no-look walk away from an explosion, we keep the small army congregating around us at bay before grabbing the final crown of the run and bypassing the security locks for the gate. Okay. We've actually now located Sleeping Like Gandalf, we assassinate both her guards and we head into the lab, which was unfortunate timing, as I was currently on a four-day streak of not shitting my pants. <laughs> Regenerators specifically preyed on slow animals as their primary food source, which, through the fault of our own rules, we'd now been demoted to this category of the food chain. Walking through the lab was pretty tense at times, but a quick shotgun to relieve the Regenerators of their legs meant we could drag them down to our level and walk tactically around them to retrieve the level 2 keycard. To get enough Tesco club card points to release Ashley, we'd need to forcibly remove the wrench from this guy's anal cavity and defend the keycard whilst it was upgraded again to level 3. Once complete and with Ashley now in tow, we fix up our next crown to sell along with the remaining treasure we had, and we begin our journey to the bulldozer section by opening the lock to the furnace area with the help from Ashley, and with a few safety shots and flashes, we're able to swiftly leave the area. Now, second only to the crossbow guys in my burn book of fugly sluts were these puzzles. Trying to time these on professional not only appeared to require a PhD in quantum physics, but the complexity of these puzzles were exacerbated by the fact that I had a biting flaccid penis jumping around me whilst I was trying to do it. Despite one death in our ledger, we get back immediately, and despite burning through all of our heels to finally nail the timing, we were able to progress and head in to turn the power on in Ashley's home the garbage disposal area. We make a daring yet leisurely escape with the Regenerador in hot pursuit before Ashley dumpsters him into the dumpster and we finally arrive to start the bulldozer section. Now once Ashley is in the cab, before her first hit on the wall, if you throw two heavy grenades at this spot here, it'll allow her to break through the wall on her first hit, skipping a huge part of this section and allowing us to head through to the lift at Mach 10 speed. At least it would have been had Ashley not been nailed in the face by an axe mere seconds later. Sadler then takes Ashley back, which, as far as I was concerned, was a win-win, and we head into Krause's encampment to begin our showdown with him. We pick up our penultimate rocket launcher of the run from the merchant and grab the Killer 7, which, with two shots into Krause's forehead and a couple more into his body, helps us to Houdini him away before we're forced to play some more hide-and-go-peek 
around his little adventure playground. Once we've made it here, a few more headshots from the Killer 7 shows why it lives up to its namesake and sends Krauser running off for his mummy. Before long, it was rocket launcher time where we silence Krauser for good and head into the penultimate chapter and scarily, our final save of the game. En route up, we're greeted by Michael, who would have come in handy a few hours ago, but I suppose beggars can't be choosers. We were undoubtedly due a few deaths here, but nothing could dampen my spirits. This was the final frontier, so we let Mike boost his KD before we destroy the AA gun early with a few heavy grenades. After using and abusing everyone here with the help of Mike, the next section provided a negative 10 points to my happiness. We start off this gaming cesspit of an area by providing the two gunners with the JFK special right off the rip, before heading straight up here to pull the right hand switch. Doing this first spawns the brute on our side of the railing, allowing us to erase him with the killer 7, meaning we can head over to flip switch 2 without getting Boromid in the back. I'm not gonna lie, I was pretty unstoppable in this section, a walking terminator in a red dress. Apparently, the only thing that could stop me was me. Despite this 13 minute setback, we head back in for round two, and with a little less unalive bombing on my part and a little more head popping, we make it through the gates and watch on as Mike goes down like the Titanic. After John wicking the Novies, we head into the final appearance of the Regenerators and another problematic location. We have another time door puzzle here that's even harder to make than the one in chapter two. However, that being said, in an ancient time long ago, in patch 104, we had the ability to clip through doors using the sniper scope glitch. And one of those doors where it worked was in fact this door. So whilst I couldn't be bothered with down patching my game just for this specific door, it could be beaten fairly whilst walking if needed, so it wasn't a failure in my eyes. As a compromise for my laziness, I went and turned the wheel and walked back to the door before morphing through it like we did in chapter two, so as to count the time fairly. With that now out of the way, we go Cape Blanchett with the budget and arrive at the final area ready to issue out a good spanking. It was a long, no holds barred fight where we not only had every enemy under the sun here, but also a glitch in the matrix where we fight one brute here, and then another just like him. With the Killer 7 and some stocked up gunpowder and large resources I'd been holding onto for a special occasion, we craft a few flashes to help us power through up to the Citadel and onto Ashley. We then get to the only part in the game where our walking handicap wasn't really a handicap. How refreshing. And after dragging Ashley's lifeless corpse all the way to the operating table, we laser the parasites out and arrive precariously at the final chapter. With us having used our final save at the start of chapter 15, we had no spare save here. And whilst chapter 16 is pretty straightforward, we still needed to be careful. Once through the Citadel, we sell all our precious weaponry to fund our final rocket launcher to help cancel Sadler's subscription to life. And with the big red one, the run was complete. Or so I thought. There was one final problem that arrived to rip victory out of our hands, happily slamming our face into the toilet to taste our own shitty water. Sadly, it looked as though the challenge had been rigged from the start. Due to the island timer initiated by Ada, after we lift the metal debris and ride off into what I thought was victory, it turns out we are literally four seconds too short from making it over the finish line. But you can't do this to me. You know how much I sacrificed? And like an innocent Japanese market worker in Hiroshima, we are subsequently vaporized, arriving back at the start of chapter 15, where I had plenty of time to think of my options here. Well, like the Ashley section, if any of you hadn't unalived yourself by jet ski sinking before on any other difficulty, if you have autosave enabled, you get sent back to your most recent checkpoint, which was right here before you get on the jet ski, but you also receive a very welcome reset to the final timer, which gives you plenty of time to make it to the end. On professional though, we don't have such a luxury. I thought we may be able to walk back to use the typewriter at the start of this section to maybe give us that little trickle of time that we needed to make it out of here, but we couldn't get back due to the bridge collapsing. For professional, this was where the challenge ended. This gut-wrenching failure caused a part of me to die here. The splintered part of my soul was wafted away like a fart in the wind. I couldn't just walk away so close to the end. So for science, I clipped through the locker here to give me that additional four seconds I needed to make it home and there it was. The S plus rank we'd been longing to see, but I wasn't filled with the same buildup of excitement and enthusiasm I'd expected. I, I kind of just felt dead inside. The answer to whether this challenge was a success or not, I'll leave up to the best judges that we have, which is you as the viewer. Unprofessional, without using a cheat of some kind, you won't ever make the final jet ski timer. On hardcore, however, I'd argue that if we count the only blocker in the game as we did in this run, I think you could absolutely walk your way to an S plus rank. I'm probably just waffling now, so I'll leave you to debate my fate 
in the comments. Thank you all so much for watching this degenerate challenge and a massive shout out to Dark Rising who actually helped to inspire this one. Very cool. If you enjoyed, be sure to leave a comment on what challenges you'd like to see me try next. And if anyone's thinking they're funny suggesting a crouch only run, you will be getting a ban.